morning, everyone. Uh, it's a big pleasure being here today. Uh, I, I did a small change in the title of my presentation because I, 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 after I finished the presentation, I realized that uh, I would talk more about food processing and human health, and not just ultra-processed food and human health. So these are the three topics. I'll start with the theses that link ultra food processing with the human health. Uh, we see the underlying hypothesis of, of, of these theses. Then we see the evidence and the potential research gaps. And finally, I'll finish with some policy implications. Uh, the thesis and hypothesis linking food processing and human health we develop in a series of commentaries, and uh, my task here, first task, would be to summarize these uh, commentaries. Uh, we always start our commentaries on food processing and human health saying that food processing is an essential part of the food system. So food processing is a responsibility of the food industry, obviously, and it, it lies in the food system between the agriculture, where food are really produced, so the industry does not produce food. The industry modifies foods. Uh, between then agriculture and the kitchen, where we prepare our foods or uh, uh, ourselves when we have uh, ready-to-consume products. And w why food processing is so essential? There are several reasons. One of them is that today, most food we consume are processed in some way. There are some few exceptions, some fruits and vegetables, but all other foods, they pass through the industry before arriving to our kitchens or to our mouths. And, and this is so because there are many advantages of food processing. I, 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 I'm, I'm describing three big advantages. The first is that food processing can increase food duration. Think pasta and pasteurized milk. Uh, it, it can, it facilitates and diversifies food culinary preparations. Imagine cook without olive oil and butter. And finally, it enhances food sensory properties. Since we are in France, think cheese and bread. And this is the reason why the most, if not all, traditional dietary partners are a combination of unprocessed and processed foods. And these are combined into freshly prepared delicious dishes and meals. This includes very healthy dietary patterns as the Mediterranean diet. So without processed food, we won't have the Mediterranean diet. But there are other purposes of food processing. Food processing can serve to do other type of, of, of products. And particularly what is important to acknowledge is that recently, more and more food processing has been used by the industry to create alternatives for food and culinary preparations, and at the same time to maximize profits. To do this, uh, uh, it's important that these novel products, it's important they are more convenient than food and culinary preparations, equally or more tasteful, equally or more affordable. But at the same time, it's important to maximize profits, it's important to have a low cost of production. So this is not easy, I mean, to compatibilize all these aims. And traditional methods used by the industry, like pasteurization, uh, fermentation, milling, freezing, uh, this process were not enough to produce these novel products. So for, to produce these novel products that uh, are uh, to create competitive and profitable substitutes for food and culinary preparations, we need a new technology. A new technology was necessary. So this new technology is food ultraprocessing. What is food ultraprocessing? Essentially, is a sequence of uh, process or steps before we have the end product, which is the ultraprocessed food. Everything started with the extraction of, of food substances from 
some foods, extraction from starches, sugars, oils, fats, protein isolates, essentially macronutrients. But these are not obtained from any food, but from a particularly few foods. Those are these high yield crops like soy, corn, wheat, sugar cane. They are very high yield crops that can be bought, bought, bought at a very low price. So after getting these food substances, then the second step is the, is, 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 involves chemical modification of these substances, hydrogenations, hydrolysis, applied to these macronutrients. Then the third step is to assemble all these food substances, again using sophisticated and uh, methods used by the modern industry. And this, the next step is the, the use of cosmetic additives, because this assemblage of proteins, starches, oils, fats, many times they are tasteless, they are colorless, they have some texture that is not appropriate. So that, that's why a very important step in the food ultraprocessing is the use of cosmetic additives. So we are talking here about flavors, colors, emulsifiers. Without these additives, these modern additives, flavors, for instance, we have more than 2,000 flavors today in the market. Without them, it would be impossible to have an ultra-processed food. And finally, you have the sophisticated packaging, with often using synthetic materials. Every step I mentioned here is important to assure uh, that these products will be able to displace food and culinary preparations and to generate profits. But at the same time they, they do this, they cause several problems. And uh, I will mention these problems during my presentation. Taking into consideration these uh, different types of processing, we, we realized that the food classification based on, on food processing would be interesting. And one of these commentaries who proposed this classification, the classification was refined, and uh, finally, in 2014, we gave the name NOVA to this food system classification, which divides foods not according to nutrients, as traditionally done, you know, protein-rich foods or fat-rich foods, but according to the extent and purpose of industrial processing. NOVA has four food groups. The first three groups, the purpose of doing uh, this three for first groups is essentially what I mentioned before. Increase food duration, facilitate culinary preparation, enhance food sensory properties. They, they share these, these, these uh, characteristics. What distinguishes these three food groups is the extent of processing. In the first case, the, 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 uh, the first group where we have the unprocessed and the minimally processed foods, uh, when we have this process in this food group, is a minimum process. So this means that the food, the whole food, the original food, is not uh, changed too much. It largely keeps the structure, the food matrix, in, 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 uh, in the case of the first group. In the second group, processing is much more aggressive because actually they, these, the second group is processed culinary ingredients. They are food substances like sugar, fats, oils. And of course, they, they don't keep the, the structure of the original food. But what's important is that this group, the second nova group, is not consumed by itself. So these things like sugar, oil, fat, salt, they are consumed together with group one food. Actually, they are necessary to prepare, to cook, to season group one foods. And the third group of processed food essentially are group one foods added of oil, salt, sugar, uh, oil, fat, sugar. And, and uh, I, I didn't say this, but group one food, we, we have no addition, no food, no, 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 no salt, no sugar, nothing. These three groups, as I mentioned before, they are the basis of traditional dietary patterns. Of course, not in equal proportion. Uh, in traditional dietary patterns, most energy comes from group one, and some from group two, and some from group three. But there's a fourth group, which is ultra-processed food. As I already said, the 
purpose of doing ultra-processed food essentially is replace all the, Nova three, the three Nova food groups and the culinary preparations you do with these three groups. And, and at the same time to maximize profits. To maximize profits and to displace the, the, the three Nova food groups, they should be done in a certain way that I described before. And essentially they are formulation of food derived substances and additives. But the formulation of this food group respond to the need, to the purpose that is underlying these, these products. There are some technicalities on the uh, classification of NOVA. Recently, uh, together with a, uh, with a group of colleagues that apply NOVA in different countries to different da data sets, we wrote up, uh, actually Nature Food Commission uh, a paper from us because there was some uh, bad use of NOVA in, in previous uh, 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 studies. So they commissioned and we did this. So I, I recommend the reading of this paper if you want to clarify some technicalities regarding where we classify breads. Breads can be processed, ultra processed, etc. We, we, there we clarify that. But let's see the, the, the hypothesis, the three hypotheses we raise it, linking UPF consumption to human health. The first hypothesis was that the, we postulated that the dietary share of ultra-processed food was increasing glo globally. The second hypothesis is that increased dietary share of ultra-processed food has several EU effects on the overall diet, including but not restricted to unbalanced nutrient profiles. And the third hypothesis that increased dietary share of ultra processed foods increased the risk of obesity, diabetes, and several other chronic diseases through various mechanisms. So these are, were basically the three hypotheses. And uh, together, taken together, if they are confirmed, by evidence, they will make our main thesis. And what's the main thesis? Is that the global displacement of traditional dietary patterns based on other groups one, two, and three, and the culinary preparation by dietary patterns based on UPFs has been and still is a major driver of the pandemics of obesity, diabetes, and other chronic diseases, and as such, must be detained and reverted by public policies. So, where is the evidence about this hypothesis? And wh what are the main research gaps? Starting with the first hypothesis that postulated that everywhere in the world, this group of foods were increasing. The best data here comes from Canada. In Canada, uh, thanks to national food purchase surveys, uh, Jean-Claude Moubarg and his colleagues were able to um, establish time trends for the four NOVA groups from 1938 to 2001. So it's quite clear here that uh, ultra-processed food increase in the national food basket in Canada, replacing particularly NOVA group one and two, meaning replacing fresh prepared dishes and meals. Processed food didn't change much. There are more data, time series, so repeated national surveys, dietary surveys, some food purchase surveys in seven other countries. And what they show in China and Brazil, in Mexico, Argentina and Spain, it's quite clear. I just saw data from Portugal yesterday. I think this will be published soon, showing more or less the same thing. Uh, when we see high-income countries, particularly USA and the UK, you, you, you see some stability in the UK, you see some increasing trends in the USA, but if you put together Canada and USA, maybe you have the whole story about the, the changes in, uh, in the um, uh, dietary share of uh, ultra-processed foods. But the most comprehensive data comes from sales. This is available for 91 countries. There, unfortunately, there's no data for low-income countries, but that's for lower middle, upper middle, and high-income countries. So you see here, it's clearly 
that in, there has increased from 2007 to 2022 in lower middle and uh, upper middle income countries where sales are lower. And in high income countries with an average of 200 kilograms per person per year, then it, apparently there is some stability. But the data from Canada, I think, helps us to understand what, is, what happened with these countries. So this is the first hypothesis. The, the big research gap is low-income countries. And uh, we don't have data in low-income countries because Euromonitor, which is the company that monitors the sales of these products, are still not interested in these markets because probably the sales are still very low. But in any case, very soon we'll have data on low-income countries from the World Poll, from Gallup, because Gallup does this World Poll every year. And now there's questions about, uh, 24 hour recall, uh, questions about uh, consumption the previous day of ultra-processed foods. So the second hypothesis, the deterioration of that quality linked to ultra-processed food consumption. The best data here comes from a systematic review and meta-analysis of 13 national dietary surveys. In several countries, including France. And what you see is the same thing. So regardless of the country, the more ultra-processed food in the diet, the higher the dietary share of ultra-processed foods, the higher the total fat content, the saturated fat content, and added sugar content, and the lower fiber, protein, and potassium. So it's, it's the perfect recipe for chronic diseases in all these, these countries. It's, it's interesting because the, the dietary share of ultra-processed food is the sum of all ultra-processed food by the total diet. The total diet is very different country to country, right? So dietary patterns are very different from country to country. But the, the share of ultra-processed food are the same because we have the same companies, the same brands, the same products. So it's, it's interesting that the conclusion here is that in any country, regardless of the dietary pattern, it's not a it's not very good, I mean, to replace traditional diets by ultra-processed foods. It's important to note also uh, that we are not talking about slight, slight uh, 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 changes when we increase the dietary share of ultra-processed foods. Let's take sugar, for instance. This was one of the first papers we published with Anne Haynes' data. So this is in the meta-analysis. What do you see here? Actually, it's for the, for the 13 countries together. This is a meta-analysis result. When the dietary share is around 15%, which is relatively low, we have 9.6% of total energy from added sugar. When you have 75%, we go to 20%. So this means if you remove ultra-processed food, not if you remove, if you reduce to the first quintile, which is more or less 15% as an average, we, we can not get rid of the added sugar, excessive added sugar intake, but of a, a, a big part of the problem. So uh, the, then some people say, no, it's, then it's added sugar, it's not ultra-processed food. No, ultra-processed food is a driver of added sugar. So it's the cause of consuming excessive amounts of sugar. So, so that's why it's so important. The same thing for fiber. So you see this huge difference if you eat more or less ultra-processed foods. The same meta-analysis provides data on the relationship between ultra-processed food and total energy intake. Here is much more complicated because it's, it's not so precise, we know that it's not so precise, the, the, the assessment of energy intake. But in any case, what we see here that the more ultra-processed food, the higher the energy intake. But this was much better studied by a randomized control trial. So the famous NIH trial that compare, uh, that offer to 20 participants either uh, a, a diet with zero ultra-processed foods and a diet with 83% of ultra-processed foods. So these people were offered this, this diet. They, they could eat as much as they want for two weeks. So it was a crossover study. So 
the 20 people, they first had the one type of diet, then the other type of diet. And, and the result was that in the 14 days of the experiment, the energy, the average energy intake was 500 kilocalories more when people got the ultra-processed diet. And this is still more important because in this trial, the two diets, they were matched for sugar, fiber, and micronutrients. As I, I, I showed to you before, ultra-processed diets tend to have much more sugar and, and, and saturated fat and less fiber, etc. But in this case, they match it because the purple was to find out if uh, the uh, higher energy intake was due to this, the nutrient profile or was due to other factors. So the conclusion was that uh, ultra-processed diet, in this case, caused an increased energy intake, regardless, independent of fiber or protein, etc. It's still more interesting, a post hoc analysis of the same trial showed that part of this excessive energy intake could be explained by two factors. The higher content of hyperpalatable foods measured with a, an index of hyperpalatability and high energy density. So then it's a, it's a very interesting demonstration of problems beyond the nutrient profile of the, of the ultra-processed foods. But there are more evidence on this in the same line. Here I put all these um, dietary changes associated with ultra-processed food, with the dietary share of ultra-processed food, that could be important to understand the next a hypothesis that link ultra-processed food with disease. So, more ultra-processed food, this is data from NHANES, more ultra-processed food means reduced intake of flavonoids and phytoestrogen, phytochemicals that are destroyed due to food processing. Also evidence of reduced total water intake, about 500 milliliters of water less if you increase if you consume a lot of ultra-processed foods. Increased intake of phytolates and bisphenol A, we heard about these uh, xenobioticus, xenobiotics in the, the previous presentation, and these are probably released, these are uh, uh, concentration in the urine, so these are probably released by packaging materials because ultra-processed foods stay with these plastic materials for years, and also acrylamide, uh, increased acrylamide probably due to this high temperature, high pressure extrusion, for instance. Increased intake of other xenobiotics. I don't know if, if you call these xenobiotics also, but I, I call them xenobiotics because emulsifiers, flavors, and high artificial sweet, they don't belong to food, right? They are strange to food. Um, and in this case, I mean, we, this is still unpublished. Uh, Bernard and Mathieu D did this analysis. This is for a paper we are writing together. And uh, we did a very simple analysis. Uh, divide the nutrient and take cohort in five quintiles, lower, lowest consumers, highest consumers of ultra-processed foods, and see the total amount of additives in, in the diet, uh, in the daily diet of these people. See the 24-hour recalls, I mean, uh, Mathilde showed to us, I mean, the high quality of this data. Uh, Emulsifiers, flavors enhancers, artificial sweeteners, and colorants were, the, the amount of them in the diet were two, three, five, and 15 times higher among the highest consumers of ultra-processed food compared with the lowest consumers. This is expected, but this is important because this can explain part of uh, what we'll see in the next uh, hypothesis where we related ultra-processed food directly with disease. So, the best evidence here, the first evidence on, on UPF and, uh, and disease were from some cross-sectional studies linking particularly UPF and obesity. But then I remember when these studies were published, now these are cross-sectional studies, this is uh, reverse causality, et cetera, et cetera. But then we start to have cohort studies. 
uh, thanks to Nutrinets and Tech cohorts, some uh, cohort in Spain, and then many others, Harvard, and Biobank, and many, many countries in Europe first, actually, and then many in the US also, and in some countries like China and Brazil. Total, we have more than 70 large long duration cohort studies that control for a broad range of potential confounders. And what, what, did, what did they show? Uh, those response association between ultra-processed food intake and 20 health outcomes, including obesity, diabetes, hypertension, uh, CVD, uh, gastrointestinal diseases, liver diseases, renal diseases, depression, dementia, and all cause mortality. So some people, they say this, no, this is too much. I mean, it's impossible, one single factor. The question is that ultra price is not a one single factor. We are talking about the dietary pattern. A dietary pattern that, as I sh sh showed before, is much inferior to the traditional dietary patterns that they replace. This is new. I mean, this is, again, the same paper we are doing together. And, uh, and this is a, a meta-analysis of uh, 16 health outcomes, studies on 16 health outcomes. For each, we have at least three cohort studies, right? So out of these 16 health outcomes, 14 out of the 16, the summary risk when we compare high versus low consumption of ultra-processed food show a significant increase. Uh, for all-cause mortality now, we have 10 studies. For uh, CVD, nine studies. Type 2 diabetes, eight studies. So you see that except for two types of cancer, in, in the other case we have, this is very consistent. I mean, this is very uh, important. When people say, oh, these are just observational studies. No, these are more than 70 observational studies showing the same thing, right? Showing the increasing chronic diseases associated with ultra-processed food. But I said at the beginning that our hypothesis was that this, uh, uh, the mechanism through which the, the UPF was causing disease uh, were different from disease to disease. So we speculate that several mechanisms could link UPF with disease. And actually, this can explain the, the, the broad range of diseases we have, uh, we, we saw in our meta-analysis. So mechanistic studies are very incipient. And this is clearly a research gap, right? So we, we, we heard already, I mean, Matildi saying different ideas about mechanisms that uh, could be investigated. But uh, uh, observational studies uh, can do something in terms of, uh, of uh, 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 mediations uh, uh, about mechanisms. So th this, this paper was very interesting because the, the two authors, they review 37 cohort studies that at, at that time were available, all of them showing UPF increased some disease. And then they compare the association before and after adjustment for fat, sugar, and, 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 and dietary nutrient profiles. And what they conclude is that the difference was minimal. Uh, 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 in other ways, the association between UPF and disease persisted, even after controlling for nutrients. So then they concluded that these uh, do not say what are the mechanisms, but, but they say they are more than the dietary nutrient profile. This is consistent with the, the Kevin Hall trial because they, uh, Kevin Hoff had two outcomes. One was energy intake, the other one is weight gain, so a proxy of obesity. And what they show is that, as expected, the 500 kilocalories more in the diet translated in more one kilogram for the ultra-processed diet and, and less one kilogram at the end of two weeks for the no ultra-processed diet. And remember that they match it, the two diets, according to protein, fiber, sugar, et cetera. So these, again, tell us there are more than, this, this does not tell that nutrients are not important. That, that's interesting. It's tricky, this. Because the design of this randomized control trial matches nutrients. When, when you match a variable, you can't study the variable, right? So, and actually, there are some studies showing that for some outcomes, sugar, for instance, can, can uh, represent 
part of the mechanism. But in any case, this shows that there are other things beyond nutrients. And remember that in the post hoc analysis, hyperpalatability and high energy density were identified as potential mechanism for energy intake and very likely for weight gain. Kevin Hall is doing now another trial testing exactly this. So he, he will have four branches, the ultra-processed diet, the non-ultra-processed diet, and plus two other diets. One with uh, the same, the, the two are matched for hyperpalatability, and the other matches for energy density. So again, he won't be able to say what are the mechanisms. He will be able to say if hyperpalatability and energy density is important or not. But then there's need more 30 trials, I mean, to really identify all the mechanism. And th that's my point. So my, my take on this uh, mechanism thing is that it's very likely that for different diseases, we have a different combination. Why just one factor? I mean, uh, is there this one factor, perhaps the emulsifiers, if we identify emulsifiers, uh, all the problem, we remove emulsifiers from the ultra-processed food, then the problem is solved. What's the likelihood of this? I mean, when you see that ultra-processed food affect negatively so many parameters of diet quality, it's very likely that you have a different combination of different mediators for different diseases. But I, I want to leave a question for you. Uh, and we start to discuss this, <laughs> Baruki responded this. It, it was exactly, it would be my response. Uh, do we need to know the exact combination of mechanisms that link UPF to each disease before recommending for people to reduce or avoid its consumption and for policymakers to implement actions to make this feasible? Uh, it's a fascinating area of research. I mean, I, I can understand perfectly this, but uh, what's your answer? I mean, my, my answer, I, I answered this question with my colleague George Screens in this paper. I won't tell you <laughs> what was my response. But in any case, suppose we do need policies, right? What would be the policies? I think that we have to learn in public health, it's always useful to learn with experience, right? So uh, public health was very successful in reduced tobacco consumption. In my country, Brazil, we had among males in my city, we had 70%. Okay. When I was a kid, the, the rule was smoking, right? Today, it's less than 10% in Brazil, the prevalence of smokers. And how this was done? With public health, I mean, with, with effective public health action. And, uh, and why this, uh, this could be, uh, uh, why this could be, we could learn from tobacco? Because there are many similarities between tobacco and the UPF. First of all, they cause a lot of diseases, not just one, a lot. A lot of burden of disease is due to ultra-processed food consumption and tobacco consumption. Second, they are very profitable. Both are very profitable. So this means they are manufactured by large transnational corporations. And these corporations have a lot of power. So these are important similarities. A second thing, they are not necessary. I mean, we, we do need food, but you don't need, for each ultra-processed food, you have an alternative. Actually, some years ago, we didn't have ultra-processed foods, right? So some people say, but how, how we could eat without ultra-processed foods? Uh, well, in a country where 60% of calories come from ultra-processed food is a reasonable question, right? But in other countries, in China, when you have 5% of ultra-processed food intake, do they need to consume more than 5%? Well, take into account, this is, uh, for my surprise, I mean, last week, probably you saw this in the Times, this is an ex-prime minister of, uh, of uh, the British Conservative Party, uh, and he, he wrote this, I mean, let's start treating ultra-processed food like tobacco. But what this means? What we did in terms of, and these are my last slides, what we did in terms of uh, 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 tobacco control. 
first of all, providing reliable information to the population. I think this is very important. This was done using, with the lead of uh, the Minister of Health, with champions, with campaigns, with mass media campaigns. Same thing should be done here. But first, we need to review countries that still have a dietary guidelines that don't mention food processing, don't mention the food industry. They need to review the guidelines, right? Because you need to incorporate these messages in the, in, the, in the dietary guidelines. Fortunately, today we have uh, more than 10 countries uh, with dietary guidelines that recommend reduction or avoidance of ultra-processed food. This includes France, this includes Israel, many Latin American countries. Mexico and Chile is not here because it was very recent. And recently uh, I was in Spain and I knew that in Catalonia and Spain, they also, the dietary guidelines recommend reduction in ultra-processed food. Some medical societies, like the American Heart Association, also introduced this recommendation in their recommendation. But information is not enough, right? We know that uh, uh, informed people is absolutely necessary, but other actions are necessary. First of all, we need to avoid this information. We need to uh, avoid incentives to unhealthy behaviors. This was done with the restriction of marketing tobacco. So the same restriction should apply to ultra-processed foods. Uh, front of package warnings that uh, were very successful in terms of uh, cigarettes, they could be used here for UPF. And again, fortunately, several countries are doing this, particularly in Latin America. Finally, creating a healthy environments Tobacco-free places, tobacco-free settings, UPF-free settings. Uh, it's absurd, I mean, to see ultra-processed food selling in hospitals. I mean, we, we have this in Brazil, not in schools, fortunately, in Brazil. As if it's forbidden, I mean, to have uh, any marketing, any ultra-processing public schools in Brazil. But in hospitals, we still have. And taxation, which is something the food industry does like. But I mean, this uh, new taxes could be used to uh, subsidize other, other processed food or minimally processed foods. So it's, uh, it's perfectly done. So um, uh, I think it's, thank you. Merci. <laughs>